This is from Acts chapter 9, um, starting at verse 1. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Wasn't it wonderful to see the children processing in with the palms here on Palm Sunday? Just a beautiful moment. And around the world today, the church marks the entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem as the king. But what happens when Jesus the king enters into not just a city, what happens when Jesus enters a heart? What happens when the king arrives at the gates of your soul? The passage that you've just heard read to you this morning tells the story of what happens when the one who is the king of kings and lord of lords humbly, graciously, and powerfully, and surprisingly enters into a person's life, especially when that person never saw him coming. I want to talk to you this morning about the surprising power of God's mercy. Palm Sunday begins Holy Week, and it will culminate with Easter Sunday. And so next Sunday, we're going to be celebrating the single greatest event, the culmination of the great event of Jesus' life, his birth, his death on the cross, his resurrection from the dead, his ascension to the Father's right hand. But next to that event, let me tell you this morning, next to theologians take all of that, by the way, they just put it all together, they call it the Christ event, Jesus' life. Next to the event of Jesus, the conversion of the Apostle Paul is the greatest single moment in human history. You may not have considered it that way. Paul will go on to write two-thirds of the New Testament, and he will write about next Sunday, that if Jesus hasn't been raised from the dead, then we're just in our sins, our faith is useless, and every church ought to be sold for a better purpose. It's over. But the reason he could write those words is because he himself had seen Christ risen from the dead. He encountered him on the road to Damascus. And he encountered Jesus not as a seeker, not as someone who was inquiring as to whether or not the claims of Jesus might be true. He encountered him as an enemy. He was transformed from being a ferocious 
persecutor of the Jesus movement to being a fervent disciple of Jesus. We actually meet him a little bit earlier in the text of Acts in chapter 8. And over in chapter 8, we read about the martyrdom of one of the deacons of the church in Jerusalem named Philip. He's one of the men who was named in the message last Sunday, one of that first group of disciples in Jerusalem that was assisting the church there. And he was put to death. He was martyred. He was stoned by his enemies. And holding the coats of the people, hurling the stones, was a young man. It says it was a young man named Saul of Tarsus. And it says that he began ravaging the church. Now that word for ravaging that's used over in Acts chapter 8 shows up in Psalms, Psalm 83, and it's a word that's used of a wild hog trampling and stomping and snorting its way through a vineyard and tearing it to shreds. It's translated in another place in uh, secular literature as a wild animal mauling something. What the bear did to Leonardo DiCaprio, Saul of Tarsus was doing to the church. He was mauling the church. He was ferociously attacking it. He was highly educated. He was from Tarsus, it says, this young man, Saul of Tarsus. If, the, if, if Athens was Oxford, Tarsus was Cambridge in the ancient world. He was very highly educated and so gifted that he, young Jewish disciple, was sent to the greatest teacher of his day, Gamaliel, in Jerusalem. So doing postdoctoral studies in Jerusalem, he sat at the feet of the greatest teacher of his day, a liberal theologian named Gamaliel, and as many students often do with their professors, went the other direction. And he became the arch conservative. He became the person who said, let's, not the kind of person who, like Gamaliel, said, well, let's just let the Christians do their thing and let's just see how this all goes. That's not Saul's response. Saul of Tarsus' response was, we got to kill these people. We have to eliminate them. We have to eradicate these people. We must arrest them. And now he's got authority from the chief priests in Jerusalem to go to the city of Damascus, about a week's journey away, and there arrest as many Christians as he can find and put them in prison and put them to death. And just before he gets there, this astonishing event happens. It says in Acts 9, he was still breathing out threats and murders against the church. He was not having a calm ride on his way to Jerusalem. Caravaggio, the great Italian artist, shows this conversion here in this famous painting. Dropped, here's, here's Saul of Tarsus dropped off his horse down on the road. But just before those moments, you can see him going along to Damascus, breathing out threats and murders. Those crazy Christians, those no good, I'm gonna, when I get my hands on them, I'm gonna lock them up and I'm gonna kill them and, and we're gonna put a stop to this thing. And Jesus looked down at him and said, I want that one. Think of the person the least likely follower of Jesus you can imagine. That was Saul of Tarsus. There have been many such conversions. We know of many in our own day. Kirsten Powers, former atheist, who has been for some years now not only been a writer for USA Today, but a regular contributor on, on Fox News. Rosaria Champagne Butterfield, another atheist who was a professor at Syracuse University. Members of the church we served in Austin had her as a professor. And they told me after they heard of her conversion. I was quoting her one time in a sermon about her conversion. And they came up to me afterwards and they said, you mean the Rosaria Butterfield from, from Syracuse University? The one that was our professor? And I said, yeah. She, they were like, that can't be. That's got to be wrong. So, oh no. They said, well, she hated Christians. Rosaria loves Jesus because of the kindness of a minister who kept inviting her and her lesbian lover over for lunch so that they could hear more and see more of the love of Jesus. So Kirsten and Rosaria and, of course, 
C.S. Lewis, another famous atheist. More about him in just a moment. Mitsuo Fuchida. That's, that's not someone many of you may know, but if you've seen the movie Pearl Harbor or Tora, 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 you'd have seen an actor playing his role. He was the lead pilot in the attack on Pearl Harbor. And this man hated Americans, and he delighted to make the lead, be the lead plane in that attack, and to signal to everyone the dropping of the bombs and the beginning of the attack. He wanted another wave of attacks. He rose to a very high place in the Japanese Imperial Army. When uh, the war was almost over, after the attack at Hiroshima, he and several of his colleagues were in Hiroshima, and he was recalled to Tokyo the day before the bombing. And he ended up not being there when the atomic bomb was dropped. After it was dropped, he was sent along with other members of a delegation to inspect the damage. Nine people were in that delegation. Every member of that delegation died of radiation poisoning except this man. Everyone died. He never had the slightest signs of any effects. Later, he was called on to testify at a trial for war crimes. And he was bitter about that. He knew, in his opinion, that surely the Americans had treated the Japanese just as badly as the Japanese had treated the Americans. I know a little something about that because my father-in-law was a prisoner of war in World War II, a prisoner of the Japanese in China. And they were treated horribly, and he was sure that they'd been treated just as horribly. But when he got to the, when he got to the hearing, he was, he was surprised to meet the man who had been his flight engineer on that attack in Pearl Harbor. He thought he was dead, but he'd been a prisoner. And he was sure that he'd been treated poorly. And he said, no, we, we were never treated poorly. He said, in fact, we were ministered to by a woman whose last name was Kavel. She came and visited us in the prison camp and took care of us. Her parents were Christian missionaries in Japan that the Japanese had killed. Their daughter decided instead of revenge to make it her life mission to minister to Japanese prisoners of war. That's your average response. Like Stephen dying, Lord, forgive them, don't hold this sin against them. He was intrigued. Fuchida was intrigued. He, this completely undoing his world. And then he came across a little leaflet that said, I was a prisoner of the Japanese. It was written by a man who was an American pilot who was on the Doolittle Raid, and he was captured by the Japanese. His name was Jacob de Shazar. While he was imprisoned, somebody passed him a leaf of the New Testament, a gospel reading, and he read it, and de Shazar was converted, and then he spent the rest of his life sharing the gospel with the Japanese people. And Mitsuo Fuchida picked up de Shazar's track, read it, then went home and began to read the Bible, and he was converted to Christ. And to Shazar and Fachita spent the rest of their lives preaching together to other people about Jesus. How can people's hearts that are going such infinitely and eternally, drastically different directions than Jesus suddenly find their lives turn around? C.S. Lewis, in his autobiographical work, Surprised by Joy, recounts the fear and the trepidation of God closing in on his life. I want to read you his words. And so the great angler played his fish, and I never dreamed the hook was in my mouth. Even if my own philosophy were true, how could the initiative lie on my side my own analogy, as I now first perceive, suggested the opposite. If Shakespeare and Hamlet could ever meet, it must be Shakespeare's doing. Hamlet could initiate nothing. My adversary waived my objections. It sank into utter unimportance. He would not argue with me about it. He only said, I am the Lord. I am that I am. Amiable agnostics will talk cheerfully about a man's search for God. To me, as I then was, they might as well have talked about the mouse's search for the cat. 
You must picture me alone in that room at Maudlin College night after night, feeling whenever my mind lifted even for a second from my work, the steady, unrelenting approach of him whom I so earnestly desired not to meet. In the Trinity term of 1929, I gave in and I admitted that God was God and I knelt and I prayed, perhaps that night, the most dejected and reluctant convert in all England. I did not then see what is now the most shining and obvious thing, the divine humility which will accept a convert on those kinds of terms. The prodigal son at least walked home on his own feet. Who can duly adore the love which will open the high gates to a prodigal who is brought in kicking and struggling and resentful and darting his eyes in every direction for a chance of escape? The words compelle intrare, compel them to come in, have been so abused by wicked men that we shudder at them. But properly understood, they plumb the depth of divine mercy. The hardness of God is kinder than the softness of men, and his compulsion is our liberation. Sometimes you will hear people say things like, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. <laughs> Tell that to Saul of Tarsus laying on the ground on the Damascus Road. Jesus didn't gently knock, he knocked him down. You may not have had such an experience. You do not have to have exactly that kind of experience to be a true Christian. I used to argue with my dad all the time because my dad couldn't tell me the date and the hour of his new birth. And I felt in my youthful zeal that it was vital that a person be able to pinpoint the exact moment when they came to faith. You don't know the day or the hour? I wisely shared with my father, you're going to go to hell. <laughs> that helped our relationship so much. <laughs> he finally grew weary of me, and he looked at me one day, and he simply said to me, I don't know, I don't need to know what time dawn was to know the sun's up. <laughs> some people have halogen bulb conversions, and some people have dimmer switch conversions. The lights slowly come on. For Paul, it was noon. It was high noon in a Middle Eastern sun. But something brighter than that flashed about him and knocked him to the ground and took away his eyesight. And whether your conversion is sudden or gradual, know this for sure. Conversion is merciful and essential. Jesus said, unless you're converted... You can't come in the kingdom. Conversion is not an optional extra. What do we learn about conversion from this text? What do we know about its truth? We need to know a couple of things. First of all, we need to know that conversion is deeply personal. When Saul's laying there on the ground, he hears a voice, as the story is related to us by Luke, and as, as, as Saul, who will become Paul, learns, and as he relates the story later in the book of Acts, he says he heard a voice, and the voice said to him, the first two words were these, Saul, Saul. Would you say it with me? Saul, Saul. He called his name. He didn't say, hey, you. Hey, you on the ground. He didn't reprove him. Where are you going? What are you doing? Saul, Saul, which in Hebrew Hebrew idiom, it says he was speaking to him in the Hebrew language. He relates this later in Acts 26. He said the voice spoke to him in Hebrew. Saul, Saul. In that idiom, to use a double name like that is a term of friendship. We have the same kind of thing happen in our language at a different end of the spectrum. It's like when your parent uses your middle name. You know there's trouble. When I was growing up, I heard, David, oh, that was trouble. If I heard, David Patrick, <laughs> the gates of hell were about to open. <laughs> All right. Saul, Saul. Not just Saul, but Saul, Saul. We might, in, in England, if Jesus was an Englishman, and some people think he is, um, he'd have said, Saul, my dear Saul. It was a term of affection. Please know this, that when Christ comes to you, he comes sovereignly, graciously, irresistibly, 
and lovingly, personally. He calls you by name. Isaiah says that God declares this about us, I have inscribed your name on the palms of my hands. And as we note about next Friday, your name is inscribed on the hands of Jesus with a Roman nail. And he sees you through his wounds, just as he saw Saul of Tarsus, his persecutor. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He called Paul personally to himself. Jesus did that with Lazarus, come from the tomb. Lazarus, come out. He called him by name. He has called you by name. He has called you, each and every one of us. Conversion is deeply personal. You are not a Christian today simply because you come to a church, to a church gathering. Personally, every single one of you are to have a relationship, a deep, abiding, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. What does it mean to be a Christian? It does not mean simply to check the boxes of orthodoxy, even though that too is vital. It means that you have met Christ. Can I ask you this morning? Have you met Christ or have you merely come to church? It was deeply personal. It was also very radical. In Acts 9, verses 5 through 9, <clears throat> it tells us in this passage that Christ, when he apprehended Paul, he knocks him down on the ground. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you? What's the word that Paul then uses? Who are you? Lord, Lord. He knows that this is, this is God. This is the Lord, this is Yahweh, but Yahweh like he's never seen him or imagined him. He's turned his world upside down. He's reached down into the core of his being. This is the man who had all the theological answers. This is the man who could see the way ahead, who knew what had to be done. This is the man who had a mission and a purpose. Now all of a sudden, lying there on the ground, the man who had all the answers only has questions. The man who led the way now has to be led by the hand. The man who could see the way ahead was now blind. When Jesus gets a hold of your life, when you are converted, he does not come into your life simply to make it better. I would love to give the altar call one Sunday morning that says, if you want your life to be worse, please come forward. No heads bowed, every eye looking around. Come forward. Because Christ went down into the depths of this man's soul, into the depths of his life, and he completely turned it upside down. He was radical with him. The one who was going to arrest Others was arrested. Paul uses that word over in Philippians. He says, the Lord Jesus laid hold of me. And that word for laying hold of people is the word that they used it for arresting people in the ancient world. The one who was going to arrest people was arrested. Paul would later describe his conversion as the light of creation breaking into his heart. He went on to describe it in Timothy as a river flooding his soul. Jesus took Paul and arrested him, broke into his, his soul with creation's light and flooded him like a river. What's conversion like? It's a river flooding in. It's a light breaking through. It's your life going one direction and Jesus stopping you dead in your tracks and going, we're going a different way. was radical. Here's the third thing. Conversion was communal. Because no one ever is converted on their own. Not really. It happens to you personally, but it happens to you in a community. So Paul's laying there. And Jesus says to him, get up. I want you to go to this place over here in Damascus. And I want you to stay there. It's the house of Judas. There in Damascus. I'm going to send you a man named Ananias. Now, Ananias is a disciple of Jesus over in Damascus. And Ananias is just having his quiet time that morning. He's just up, thinking about the message from the previous Sabbath. He's praying, and suddenly Jesus speaks to him. 
Ananias, I want you to go over to Straight Street. You can still go on Straight Street in Damascus. You go over to Straight Street to the house of Judas. There's a man waiting there who I'm going to have you pray for. Excellent idea, Lord, said Ananias. Good idea, Lord. It's a Monty Python reference there. Only two people laughed. <laughs> of course it's a good idea. All right, so off he goes. He's going to go. No, no. Good idea, Lord. Who is it? It's a man named Saul, Saul of Tarsus. And Ananias says, Lord, um, have you read this morning's papers? Do you have any idea who this guy is? Now, you see, you're always in an interesting prayer time when you are informing Jesus about what's supposed to be happening. <laughs> and Jesus says, Ananias, I know, I know. But let me tell you something, Ananias. This man is a chosen instrument of mine. I want you to go to him. I want you to lay your hands on him. You know, we never read about this man, Ananias, ever again. But how many of you know if the only person you ever laid your hands on and baptized in your whole life was the Apostle Paul, that's a pretty good day at the office. <laughs> and so he goes to him. And I don't want you to miss the first two words out of his mouth when he walks in on Saul who hasn't eaten in three days and is blind and has got nothing but questions. And he walks up to Saul, the persecutor, the ravager of the church, and the first two words out of his mouth, don't ever miss them, brother Saul, brother Saul. The first two words that Saul heard from a Christian after his conversion. The first words he heard from Christian lips were not, why did you do what you did? What were you thinking? The first two words he heard were words of love. Brother, Saul. He called him brother. I don't know how every other Christian would have responded. We know that when news got out about him, a lot of people thought he was a fraud and a fake. And he was just kind of going third column, fifth column into the, uh, into the Christian community as a spy. They didn't believe at first until another man named Barnabas took him under wing. But Ananias believed. Brother Saul. Can I put this in perspective for you? What if this morning, right here on the front row was a man who three days ago had a vision of Jesus while he was planning a bombing in Nashville because he was the head of an ISIS cell that was located in Green Hills. And Jesus appeared to him and then said, I want you to go to Christ Community Church and I want you to sit on the front row and there I've appointed some people to lay hands on you and pray for you. And he comes in in all of his gear, comes in wearing his, his stuff. Would your first words be, brother? Paul was a murdering, terroristic threat to the ancient Christians. And Jesus arrested him. And he became the Apostle Paul. And it took a community of people to get around him because conversion is deeply communal. When King Jesus rides into your life and the palm branches are waving and everybody's shouting Hosanna, that's a beautiful moment. But you're going to have to be surrounded with people who love you and teach you to sing. Conversion, finally, is purposeful. When Paul later relates this story, he picks up on the words that Jesus actually said to Ananias. Ananias said, the Lord said to Ananias, I want you to go over there. He's a chosen instrument of mine. Paul, in Acts 26, before King Agrippa, when he's telling the story of his conversion, he says, he says that Jesus spoke to him on that road. Paul or Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting. But arise, <clears throat> go to Straight Street, to Judas's house, 
over in Damascus. It'll be shown to you what you're to do. For this purpose, I have appeared to you to appoint you as a minister. Paul's conversion was also a commission. Paul's conversion was also a commissioning. For this purpose, I have appeared to you. For this purpose. Would you say it with me? For this purpose. Many people think that they've become Christians just so they can go to heaven. But for most of us, we got a long time to go before we make that trek, that final journey. Jesus saved you. Jesus converts you because he has a mission for you right here, right now. It's in your neighborhood. It's in your workplace. It's in your family. It's in your church. It's in your city. For this purpose, you have not been saved just to go to heaven when you die. If that was the only reason you got saved, they should have just shot you and sent you on your way. <laughs> saved now. See ya. No. For this purpose, I have appeared to you to appoint you. When God lays hold of your life, just like he laid hold of C.S. Lewis, just like he laid hold of Kirsten Powers, just like he laid hold of Rosaria Butterfield, just like he laid hold of C.S. Lewis and Mitsuo Fuchida and Jacob DeShazer, just the way he, he laid hold of that, that woman whose parents were murdered and she became the minister to the murderers. That same Jesus who appeared to them has come to you and his purpose in your life is no less than his purpose in theirs. And you will not be standing on judgment day questioned about whether or not you served like C.S. Lewis or Mitsuo Fuchida, whether you wrote those books. No, 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 that was their purpose. But we're gonna give an account for our purpose, what God called us to do. We're born again originals and die copies. God has a purpose in your life. He's called you to it. He has a mission for you. You may be in a wheelchair, but God has a mission for you. You may not have been converted until you were 80, but God has a mission for you. You may have grown up in a, a background of racism and hatred, but God has a mission for you. You may have grown up as an orphan, but God has a mission for you. Christ saves you and appoints you to his purpose right here. And that's why Paul said, I'm going to lay hold of that for which he laid hold of me. He arrested me. And I want to do everything he arrested me to do. Go, Ananias. He's a chosen instrument of mine. You know what happened that day? One of the wolves... One of the wolves became a lamb. That's what conversion is. One of the wolves became a lamb. On March 31st, 1974, I was sitting in a little Lutheran church in north central Indiana, Holy Cross Lutheran Church, And an old man named Bill Long stood up at the front and he said, being a Christian is about having a relationship with Jesus. And you may believe all the right things, but do you know him? And I can't tell you everything that happened in that moment. I'm not going to tell you that that's exactly the moment of my conversion because I really don't know. Maybe it happened when my parents dragged me kicking and screaming to church when I was eight days old and they poured water on my head. How's that for being seeker sensitive? Maybe it happened in the catechism classes I took and the confirmation with the laying on of hands. Maybe it happened at my first communion. I really don't know. I do know that God was always at work in those times, but I also know this, and on that Sunday morning, on March 31st, 1974, when Bill Long said those words, all the information that was right here traveled 18 inches to my heart. And suddenly Jesus stepped out of history 
and became more real to me than any person I'd ever met in my life and any person I've ever met since. And that's my question for you this morning. And it's my offer to you this morning. Bill Long said to that little group of people that morning, if you want to know Jesus personally, imagine this in a Lutheran church. Those of you who know Lutherans, he said, come forward. Let me tell you, Lutherans do a lot of things. We have potlucks. We have casseroles. A Lutheran diet is a piece of pound cake in both hands, okay? <laughs> Lutherans don't have altar calls. But we did that day. And I found myself getting up out of my seat and coming to the front, and I knelt down, and I wasn't the only one. I wasn't a lot, but I wasn't the only one. And somehow in that moment, I was stepping forward because Jesus had stepped in. And I want to ask you this morning, has Jesus stepped in? Have you been converted? Would you stand with me? Has the Jesus that Paul met, is that Jesus the Jesus you've met? Would you bow your head with me? Lord, if there's anyone here this morning who doesn't yet know you personally, I pray they will come to know you. I pray, Lord, that they will come to the realization, not just of the truth in their heads, but the truth of the person in their heart. Bring us to saving faith, I pray, in Jesus' name. Now, I'm going to give you the same offer he gave me. I'm just, I, I'm not going to, we're not going to sing just as I am six times. We're not. But I, I just want to say this. I'd like for a couple of the elders just to come on down here and Join me in front, a couple of the women's leaders. And if this morning you need to have Jesus in your heart and you don't know that he's there, you're not sure, but you want to be, I want to invite you to come forward. I did. I want to invite you to come forward. You can come forward in a Presbyterian church just like I came forward in a Lutheran church. It's not the normal course of action. But we're going to just be abnormal this morning. Is that okay? And I want to invite you to come. We've got a closing song. We're going to sing together, and if during that song you want to come and pray with me or some of the other folks, I want to invite you to come. I don't care if you're 80 or 8. You want Christ. I want you to come. Let's sing together.